Welcome to the Birth Journeys Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Hoff, BSN RN. I am a wife, a mother of two, and a nurse specializing in the care of women and newborns. In this podcast, we will share powerful journeys of birth givers with the goals of lifting the veil on the birth experience, healing through sharing, and beginning an open conversation to strengthen trust and promote transparency between birthing people and healthcare providers. Hello. Today I have with me Dr. Shweta Patel. Dr. Patel is an OBGYN and a women's health expert. She created GaiaWellness.org where women can meet with their women's health physician online. Dr. Patel provides comprehensive women's health care online to women in Florida with plans to expand nationwide. And she also offers the Gaia Wellness Forum on Facebook, which is open to anyone who has ever identified as a woman and who is interested in contributing to women's health concerns. Today, we are going to be discussing the medications Mifeprestone, also known as RU486, and Mesoprostol, also known as Cytotec, and the barriers that will be created for women attempting to access health care if the Mifeprestone ban is successful. Dr. Patel, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Kelly. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm going to let you take the floor because you are the women's health expert. And then I'm probably going to be asking you some questions in a bit. So I can't wait to hear what you have to say. All right. So I think that understanding the two medications and how they work are fundamental in identifying or distinguishing what they do and what their purpose is. They're not the same and they're not even a part of the same category per se, though they are both used for the common purpose of abortion. And mifeprostone is actually used specifically for that purpose as opposed to mesoprostol, which is used for even purposes down the line later in pregnancy when we're actually getting ready to start a woman in her labor process. It's very different in terms of like its potential uses and often kind of use inaccurately and interchangeably, but uh, not the case. So mifeprestone, also known in the past as RU486, also in the past referred to as an abortifacent. And the reason for that is because there's a difference between a medication that helps remove a pregnancy by actually changing the environment in the womb versus a medication that causes the womb to start contracting and being an unstable environment for a pregnancy, which is why we don't use mifeprestone in induction of labor because it doesn't have that single purpose of just creating like contractions and inducing labor. Now, the way mifeprestone works primarily is by impacting a woman's progesterone levels in her uterus and depleting that will cause the pregnancy to fail. So even if it has established implantation, it won't be able to continue staying attached. And if there has not been implantation, which really, if that's it's that early, then we wouldn't really even be looking into the scenario. But the reason why it's more potent than mesoprostol in accomplishing a termination of pregnancy is because of the effect that it has on the hormone levels. And on a cellular level, it actually is able to stop the pregnancy from continuing. Whereas mesoprostol also has an impact on the uterus, but not on that hormonal level. It, what it does is actually creates irritability in the uterus and it makes the cervical mucus loosen up and the cervix to soften, which is why it's also often referred to as a cervical ripening agent and is used in labor or is used to induce labor. And so used alone in a pregnancy that is healthy and growing and attached early on, its success rate is not as pronounced and it can probably take anywhere from a single dose to multiple doses to actually have the pregnancy come out. In contrast to that, mifepristone is more likely to be effective on the first round. And currently, when a termination is necessary or being attempted, they're actually used in conjunction because of the fact that they work differently. They can actually work synergistically so that the pregnancy begins to detach because of the mifeprostone, and then the uterus is able to contract and expel it because of the 
misoprostol. So the medication right now that our courts are fighting over currently is the mifeprostone. It seems like if we were to base it on just what the drugs do, it seems like a no-brainer if someone is anti-abortion and we are thinking in terms of black and white, no more abortion, ban the drug. But in terms of women's health, that's not as cut and dried. Can you explain what, what are we at risk of right now? If, if we ban this drug, what kind of women's health concerns would we then not be able to address? If mifeprostone was effectively banned nationwide, and just looking at that in, in an isolated setting, not necessarily that abortion is banned, particularly in that state or setting, but if some state legislature or legislation uses putting a bottleneck on the availability of the medication, to circumvent perhaps their inability to directly ban abortion, then all they're going to be creating is a physiological unsafe hurdle for women who are going to need or choose to have an abortion because mifeprostone is more effective and safer than the alternative in accomplishing a abortion for whatever reason or need, the alternative being having a surgical procedure. If the abortion is initiated without the mifeprostone in play, then it's more likely with just mesoprostol alone, it'll take longer. It will be very uncomfortable for the woman and it'll still be likely to not completely complete itself. And so as a result, there's a higher chance that a woman will then need to have a suction DNC, which is a minor procedure, and it's not high risk or unsafe, but any procedure is still a procedure. There is more risks than not having the procedure. And by reducing access to mifeprostone, we are going to essentially necessitate electing for the procedure more to avoid a woman needing to go through the more cumbersome and uncomfortable and less effective process of using mesoprostol alone. So using mesoprostol versus mifeprostol, mm -hmm. using it alone is going to be less effective. And if that's what we have left to use because mifeprostol is banned, then we'll just have more women resulting in needing a DNC. Why would someone need a DNC? I mean, can't the body just get rid of it itself? What are the risks? One of the things that we discussed, like a woman has three options when she is needing a DNC. And one of them is very much just what we call expected management, which is wait and see what your body does. Because back in the day when we were still crawling on all fours and we happened to have an unsuccessful pregnancy, you know, we didn't go signing up for a procedure because it was quicker or less painful, our body did take care of it on its own. Granted, back in the day, we only lived to about 35. So, you know, that was because sometimes our body wasn't able to complete it on its own. And then you develop an infection and then you develop pain and bleeding and then it impacts your future fertility and so on and so forth. We've come a little bit since then, you know, like standing upright and stuff. So now we can use this medication instead to facilitate the process that either will not happen on its own, has started to, but has not completed, or has started and then failed. And now there's a need of completing the process and we need to bring in the medication. And in the scenario of like why a woman would need a DNC, straight off the bat, there are, as I was mentioning before, you know, the risk of having an infection or the risk of having a significant complication like DIC. These could be Things that happen, whether a woman has a live pregnancy that's early on or whether the woman has a pregnancy that's already passed, but is still inside the uterus, something we call a missed abortion. And that just means that if there was a heartbeat before, it stopped, or if the pregnancy has stopped growing, even if there was never a heartbeat. And when that scenario presents itself, it is in the woman's best interest to have that pregnancy removed. Her body won't really move forward in getting back to its normal cycle and then being able to become pregnant again until that process happens. And the longer it takes, the higher the risk of things like infection and heavy bleeding, as well as like I was mentioning before, DIC or where your body starts to essentially use up all of its ability to make blood clots so that when you do start to bleed, you can't stop. And it can happen because of a pregnancy that has not been removed and has stayed inside the body for too long. So those are 
more of the acute scenarios where it's necessary to facilitate the process. Other scenarios could be where a mom either has a long-term health concern or risk that would be lethal or threatening to her own life. And if she was to continue the pregnancy, women have conditions like cardiovascular problems where they are literally not capable of housing another growing being inside of them because of the vascular tax it has on your heart. It's like trying to drive a car and revving the engine when you're not, we have like no gas left whatsoever. And you can basically blow out the engine. In this scenario, that would be cardiac arrest. And the woman can literally die because she is pregnant. And it's usually not the case early on, but as the pregnancy progresses and it becomes more and more cumbersome on the mom's heart, it can happen. It can also happen at a time where if the mom is pushing or is bearing down, that can compromise her health or cause cardiac arrest. In those scenarios, we opt to usually offer the woman a C-section, but that's if she gets to that point, survives to that point. So there are scenarios where a mom would say, this is literally going to kill me if I continue this. There are also lethal genetic conditions in mom that could be potentially passed down that the mom could choose to not want to continue the pregnancy with. Nowadays, we have testing that is so sophisticated that you can, we can actually test and see if mom has these kinds of genetic disorders and the likelihood of her being able to pass them on. But really, we won't know if the fetus has them until it's born without having to do anything invasive that could then compromise the pregnancy itself. And so it's a gamble. You would be taking odds on whether you are continuing a pregnancy that will then eventually not survive because of whatever lethal genetic or life compromising condition. And then there's also the scenario where if a mom has multiple babies or what we call multiple gestations, again, now with moms becoming pregnant later and later and the impact that age has on fertility, the need for reproductive or artificial reproductive assistance is more and more. And it's great that we have the science to be able to give women the opportunity to still experience motherhood, but it's not a precise science. It's definitely more precise than what we've had in the past, but there is still a potential that if a woman has a, a single embryo of hers implanted by IVF, that it could split. And usually most women will have more than one embryo placed because the chance that it could fail. And so the process is so expensive and so physiologically cumbersome that rather than wait for an entire another cycle to do this again, sometimes they will have two embryos placed together so that if one doesn't succeed, they still have a decent chance of having a successful live birth. And that works out great as long as those two embryos just, you know, keep to themselves and don't necessarily decide to split. But if one does and you've got triplets, if both do, then you've got quadruplets. And with each increased order or increased number of gestation, the risk is higher and higher to all of them and to mom. And the risk is higher in terms of them having complications in the pregnancy, the risk is also higher that one or all of them don't survive at all. And so there are times where a mom is offered reduction, which is just another fancy way of saying a selective termination, where they eventually have to pick which pregnancy they will want to continue or which two or which three, depending on how many there are, so as to optimize the chances that those will even survive altogether because they are not competing with so many other pregnancies. And that's a, that's a tough decision and a tough place to be in. I don't envy the women who have to make that decision, but they are kind of, it is the forest for the trees situation where you're looking to give the surviving babies the best chance that they have of being healthy and making it to be born. Those are the scenarios where we know that choosing to do a termination may become a necessity or a relative necessity. Of course, there are various other reasons that either don't come with an explanation or may not come with an explanation that we may necessarily agree with, but those would be the ones that I would say, at least medically, would be justifiable. So if this were to proceed and this drug were to be removed from the market or unavailable, all of those procedures would then become much more difficult, if not impossible. So if, if misoprestone was to be removed from the market or become inaccessible, first of all, I think if it's removed from the market, it's going to create a 
submarket where people are finding a alternative version that's laced with like rat poison and you know right right we've accomplished something so much better now by decreasing access to availability but if it was to be unavailable in the general medical market i think that especially in the scenarios where a mom is choosing to have an elective termination, it would necessitate having a procedure more. It is indirectly just a hurdle being created for those women. So when you are when you say elective termination, that, that includes things like if we had what you're describing as a missed abortion, being able to just take a pill to prevent infection, to prevent hemorrhage, to prevent things like DIC, which you described as the condition where we use up our ability to blood clot. I'm trying to explain this for people that are not medical and re- remind them. Right. So the tricky thing is when a pregnancy has already passed, meaning that it's no longer growing or it doesn't have a heartbeat, the presumption is that it is easier to have the process complete itself using mesoprostol alone. And so at least in, in general practice, doctors don't use mesoprostol mm-hmm. routinely in those scenarios. Okay. Um, I don't know how much of that is because it's such a unnecessary process to get it. And not necessarily available in hospitals. Right. But even though it's more effective, I think our default is to try Cytotec. Right. A mesoprostol. And, and if it doesn't work, try it again. And if it doesn't work and the woman's still stable and she's not wanting surgery, try it again. Because there's really no medical harm that comes from using Cytotec. Mm-hmm. It's actually... FDA approved for the purposes of gastric ulcers. Right. It happened to be an indirect use that we discovered where, oh, it makes women's cervix softer. I don't really know how they gauge that randomly, but it causes women to have lots and lots of cramps. So I think that it will still be something that medically necessary abortions or missed abortions will still be able to just use mesoprostol side attack and the world will go on as it is right now. I do think that we have more failures in that process because we don't bother using mifeprostone. Mm-hmm. And I do think that in any other scenario where we are trying to facilitate completing a miscarriage or an abortion without having to use surgery, it is definitely going to result in needing to use surgery more. Yeah. Which we're already kind of there. They're trying to make it harder. Right. So we are just kind of going down the path of making women's health less effective. More challenging. More challenging. Right. More dangerous. Almost like an you know, obstacle course that you have to somehow justify getting the care or at least of the quality and safety that you would want it for the purposes of legislature. Yeah. Laws have changed at this point. I'm just thinking of the people that have had genetic anomalies that were not conducive to life. Are you pregnant and planning a hospital birth? You don't need a birth plan. You need a birth vision. In my opinion, birth plans set you up for failure. Yep, I said it. Hear me out before you turn off this podcast. You may think that by downloading a generic birth plan, it means you're in control. The truth is it's not that simple. No one can control exactly how their birth will go. There are way too many variables. What every pregnant person wants is to walk into the hospital pregnant and to walk out with a healthy newborn in their arms. The journey in between is the murky part. It's hard to know what issues might come up that need to be addressed. If you focus your energy on a birth vision rather than giving your power to a birth plan, you can empower yourself to make the best choices for you and your baby. That's why you need to get into my Empowered Hospital Birth Program. As a labor nurse and mindset coach, I can help guide you through the process of maintaining the calm autonomy that will help you achieve the birth vision you desire. In my Empowered Hospital Birth Program, I will help you identify the source of anxiety you have surrounding hospital birth, fill in knowledge gaps to make sure that you are fully informed and confident, learn key phrases so you can better communicate with your medical team, emotionally process your fears so that they don't hold power over you. Go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered to book a free 30-minute private birth vision call where we will identify your top fears and must-haves and gain clarity on exactly how you want to feel in the birth space. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. I'm honored to be a part of your birth journey. Yeah, 
I've actually had a patient in that scenario. So here was a woman who was at the 13-week visit. She had had the cell-free DNA testing or the non-invasive prenatal testing, as it's called. Some people might know it as like Panorama or some people know it as like Avero. There's all these companies that come up with it. All it is is that it's testing now that allows us as early as 11 weeks and change to know the gender of the baby as well, genetically speaking, not because we can see anything yet. They all look like nubbins at that point, but also identify three of the most common genetic abnormalities if they're there by looking at those chromosomes, chromosomes 21, 18, and 13, and then the X and Y. And this is done by a simple blood test in mom because approximately 11 weeks onwards, there are sufficient cells of the fetus that escape into the maternal circulation. And so when we do a blood test, we can actually identify those cells and run those genetics on them. So I had this patient who had done that testing and was at the 12 to 13 week mark, she found out that she was having a baby with trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome and it is lethal. It's non-conducive to life outside the uterus. And oftentimes it does not allow for life to progress even within the uterus after a certain point. And so knowing that she had because this was a military hospital and the ethics involved and the policy involved in how we handled abortions at that facility, which was that we did not offer elective terminations whatsoever. She, I had to run it up the ethics committee before I could offer her to have a, the process of termination if she so chose to want to terminate this early in this stage, knowing that there was not going to be the potential for it a healthy live pregnancy coming out of it. And beyond any other reason, just to avoid the then more involved process and more risk for surgery and complications to her, that would inevitably become a possibility because the baby was farther along when she would then finally need to have the baby come out. And we wouldn't know when at what point she was going to have either the baby stop growing or she was going to go into labor. But the scenario could have been anywhere between she delivered the baby alive and then it did not survive beyond a few moments or a few minutes, a few hours, rarely days, or more likely that it kept going until the third trimester. And, and now you have all this time for the mom to be aware of this pregnancy, attached to this pregnancy, see all these formative changes, and then know that at any moment, at any day, the heart's going to stop and there's absolutely nothing that can be done about it. In fact, we're just waiting for that because that is when finally the next chapter can begin, which is we can now offer to deliver this pregnancy for her and she can begin to grieve and attempt to move forward. And so thinking of my patient first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that I knew what options were available to her. And so we ran it up the ethics committee, and then we were able to come to an agreement that it would be judicious and ethically overall best for her if we offered her, if we allowed the option of an elective termination in her early stages, knowing full well that this was not going to result in any increase or decrease loss of life, but would potentially decrease the trauma to her both physically and emotionally. And she was very gracious about it. And she was very thankful that we had gone through the process of being able to offer that to her. She ultimately elected to continue the pregnancy. I think at the time it was because she was still hopeful that we were all wrong. And that's very understandable because there are times where we're wrong. When areas like this, less likely, but you know, you can't fault someone for having hope in, in this kind of scenario. And she did end, end up eventually losing the baby at 34 weeks and went through the process of having a induction with Cytotec, Mesoprostol, where she was finally able to go into labor and go through the entire process of pushing and finally deliver the baby and then have the ability to spend some time with the baby and take pictures, even for babies that have demised in utero. We offer those brief services so that the family has the ability to have something to remember the baby by. And so... For her, that was her way of getting to that level of closure, feeling, being at peace with the fact that the pregnancy did not work out. I can completely understand other women in that same scenario feeling like they can't choose that, that for their emotional well-being, for something that's not going to work out in the long run, it would be better for them to then embrace the reality now when it's earlier 
and less likely to involve a more elaborate process of delivery. Because even the patient I was referring to earlier, she could have ended up needing a C-section if her labor stalled, or if the baby's position was in, in a way where it was not conducive to delivering vaginally. And it's not unfathomable to have a C-section, but a woman shouldn't be required to have to go through a surgery like that. You know, that's so involved and so uncomfortable and can be even more traumatic, especially when you're not going home with the baby. Or in a scenario where, again, another military family, this was not the exact same scenario of needing to have an abortion, but this woman had lost her baby full term. She delivered a baby who had a heartbeat and then it passed. And she was a military wife and her spouse was a Marine getting deployed often. She was 37, 38 years old. And most people would think, oh, the, the healthy thing to do after you have a loss like that is to take some time, breathe process. And she just didn't feel like she had that luxury because her spouse was going to get deployed again in like two months, gone for anywhere from nine months to 13 months. And she was already feeling like she was at a challenging age for pregnancy. And so she decided to get right back into the process. Now, if you are someone who has a pregnancy that has like a lethal defect or it's not conducive for life, and you're in a similar situation as the second woman that I'm mentioning, well, then being required to continue the pregnancy until it naturally expires and then missing a window where you could potentially still have a healthy pregnancy again. Again, it's one of those things where you're advocating for your patient. That's not what's best for her interest. Those are the scenarios where sometimes when there is, in the long run, no more life lost, that even with a heartbeat, pregnancy could necessitate being delivered or having a termination. And in that scenario, using biotech alone, mesoprostol is kind of suboptimal and not the best and greatest accessible care. Well, additionally, so if someone has had a healthy pregnancy and then finds out that the next pregnancy is very, very low survival potential and has had a previous C-section, what are the risks of carrying that pregnancy to term and then trying again? Like how much longer would we be prolonging that process to be able to start trying to have a viable pregnancy? And that's the other thing is you bring in so many other factors into the equation. If she continues the pregnancy to a point where it is now something that would need to be delivered as opposed to what we would consider a termination, meaning basically third trimester, then we're assuming she has access to care where she can actually have a vaginal attempt. After you have a C-section, there's a risk of having the complication of a uterine rupture where the scar is. And we usually don't use mesoprostol in that scenario, which is the only drug that we do use to induce labor effectively, at least to get it started. And we can use Pitocin or oxytocin, but again, it's suboptimal to start with that. And then the counter argument is, well, and this may sound a little crass, but it's like, well, this is not a live baby. So the concern for a uterine rupture, you know, it's not going to compromise the fetal well-being, but the mom could still have an impact from that. And it's not necessarily something we just want to lay relay on. And so by using mesoprostol later in the pregnancy to help induce labor, it's putting the patient at, at a risk that we could avoid if they weren't in that situation at all. Or she could have a repeat C-section, which again is a, another surgery, which will also commit her to only having C-sections moving forward. Whereas if she has one C-section, and is able to have a vaginal delivery after that, she could then be a candidate for continuing to have vaginal deliveries for future pregnancies. What we call a TOLAC or a trial of labor and a VBAC, which is vaginal birth after C-section. So there's so many little intricate factors that come into play there. Some hospitals don't even offer trials of labor. They only allow repeat C-sections if somebody's had a C-section before. And so in that scenario, again, a woman is therefore now required to either go through a repeat C-section for a non-viable or already demise pregnancy, or she has to travel somewhere where there is a hospital that can accommodate. And these are all things that I'm sure she's not thinking of at like the 12 week mark when she has to make this decision. Yeah. I mean, it complicates everything. Additionally, if you have to have that C-section, if you don't have the option of terminating the pregnancy early enough to use a more efficient medication or you rupture and you now need to have a C-section to get this process right. 
expedite it and to save your life. But then later, and you can get pregnant again, I suppose. I mean, it could physically happen, but then there's even greater risk of uterine rupture. And if that pregnancy is viable, losing that pregnancy because the uterus hasn't had time to heal. So it just, it turns into this big spiral of events that that makes fertility and live birth later a much more difficult and high risk process. Absolutely. I mean, the risk of a uterine rupture increases with each C-section. The risk of having something called a placental accreta increases with each C-section. And the risk of having a hysterectomy as a life-saving measure in response to exorbitant bleeding increases with the number of C-sections you've had. These are all things that, you know, we don't lead with when we're having the beautiful, happy, joyous conversations of how we're going to have a baby. But those are the realities that become acutely in the forefront when a complication is happening, like a uterine rupture. And now we have to do a C-section for a woman who just tore through her previous C-section scar. And we are doing this emergency C-section to save her life, to deliver a baby that's passed. And she ends up bleeding so much that she ends up having a hysterectomy. And the alternative ending would have been if she had elected to terminate at the 12-week mark earlier in the pregnancy. So then there's the other... The other scenario that you talked about, so for instance, if there was a pregnancy, the multiple gestation that became... And that scenario, it's a little different. That's more to kind of identify scenarios where termination may become the more optimizing choice as opposed to a scenario where mifeprestone is needed. Because when those kinds of terminations are being done, they're not done using those medications because it would risk all of the pregnancies. So instead, it's usually done by the form of like a laser ablation or essentially an invasive procedure in that one pregnancy alone, or the other, you know, one or two fetuses alone, um, to cause them to not grow anymore. But it's not using either of the medications. So then, to play devil's advocate, why why wouldn't it be better to use some of those techniques? for the same quote-unquote elective termination rather than the mifeprostone. Do you mean like when we're doing like a selective reduction? No, just in general, because we've got people that are arguing that this drug shouldn't be on the market. And so then why not use something that is like you actually have to go into the hospital and a medical provider has to actually do all of the things. It seems like it's not important to legislators that are pushing this that we do more invasive procedures. So why couldn't we just plan a procedure like a laser ablation to end the pregnancy in a medical scenario? Because the laser ablation is specifically for scenarios where you want the pregnancy overall to continue. You just don't want all of them. So it's more specific in stopping the growth of one or two of the fetuses so that the others can survive. If they were given mifeprostone at that time, the medication would cause all of them without discretion to start to separate and fail. So that's why that medication would not be something we could use in the reduction setting. Mm -hmm. And alternatively, in the other direction, laser ablation or reduction would not be an effective way to terminate a single pregnancy, whatever the reasons, because all it would do is stop the heartbeat. It wouldn't actually cause the pregnancy to then come out, Mm -hmm. which would then end up being, not to mention it's an invasive procedure to accomplish something that can be done without. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the reason why I think mefeprostone is unique in its effectiveness is because it works so early on. So for whatever the scenario, medical, elective, religious, social, political, if a woman is having an abortion, the most optimum time would be in a perfect world would be that she didn't even have to experience this. But in the setting of what we're dealing with, which is reality, the earlier, the better, the earlier, the less harm, the earlier, the less need for surgery and the earlier, the less need for, you know, invasive procedures and the risk of complications and then the worst case scenario happening. And there's only one drug that allows for that. I mean, there's actually, that's not true. There are, there's other medications that we could start administering women if they needed to have that early on. In fact, we do. We, we, um, have it available openly in emergency rooms. It's called methotrexate. Mm-hmm. It's given to women when they have an ectopic pregnancy, which is literally going to tear through their fallopian tube and cause them to bleed internally until they die if not detected, not to mention lose one of their fallopian tubes or possibly the remaining fallopian tube because oftentimes 
you have one ectopic risk for having another. And so by the way, methotrexate is a chemotherapy drug. I don't think though that is a very effective way to stop a pregnancy from growing. And then once it's no longer growing, it could become something that we use Cytotec for, or we just use Mifeprostone. It just accomplishes what the woman is trying to accomplish, whether it's medically justified or not, or whether you agree with it, I agree with it or not. If there is a woman who is trying to accomplish an abortion, the safest way to do it would be the earliest possible. And the only medication that is effective that early on and isn't chemotherapy is Mifeprostone. So to paint a picture of what might happen, so for instance, you said infection is a risk. Going back to that, why not just give her antibiotics and like just kind of let the body do what it wants? You can't. You can, you can give her antibiotics and hope that that's sufficient, but you can't guarantee a patient won't develop sepsis, in which case and her whole body becomes an unsafe environment for the pregnancy. I think it's easy to forget the host, I guess you can say, or what do we call it? What do we call it back in the- The vessel. The vessel, right? It's like power, passenger, and pelvis, right? So it's easy to forget the pelvis right? because we're so focused on the passenger. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's easy to, not easy. Let me use a better word. I think as a society, we are very focused on those who can't speak for themselves. Right. And- for good reason. Yeah. That's a testament to our humanity and our t- a testament to our innate goodness. Mm-hmm. I think that where we go wrong is the different ways that we show it right. or expect it to be shown. But wanting to, as a result, advocate for the pregnancy and in the process, subjecting the host or the vessel or also known as the woman in this situation subjecting her to risk is not going to reverse time and make the scenario unnecessary. It's just going to potentially compromise her health, which will then come right back to compromising the passenger. Right. The baby. Yeah. Yeah. In a scenario where if this was something that needed to happen, yes, we could do a plethora of other things, but it doesn't take away the fact that yeah, we can do a DNC. Sure, we can do a Cytotec, Mesoprostol, till the cows come home. We can even give a dose of methotrexate because we're trying to accomplish this with all the tools we have in our tool belt, except methoprostone because it's been banned. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's like going back to using rotary phone when we have more advanced technology mm-hmm. because we want people to engage more right. <laughs> directly. Yeah, It's like, but you still have the phone. Right. It's not, you're not solving anything by creating this hurdle, but you are creating new potential problems. Yeah. I just feel like a lot of the arguments are, well, but you could do this. Well, but you could do this. But the thing is the availability of resources at medical facilities. I mean, if every day we waited until things were an emergency, we're not just putting that one patient at risk. We're putting all patients at risk. And we've we've seen this in the past pandemic. The more at-risk patients you have at the hospital, the less you are able to care for other patients and everybody suffers. Right. And again, in a perfect setting, what current legislature is trying to accomplish with banning Mifepristone, if we're to kind of like just put ourselves in, in that faction's mindset to understand what's the logic there. I understand they want to reduce or minimize unnecessary or unethical you know, loss of life in the form of a termination by limiting access to something that facilitates that. It's not going to prevent that from happening. It's just going to make it riskier and less effective. And make everybody else unsafe. Right. And if we're not solving what they consider to be a problem altogether by doing something, then are we actually, are we just creating something for the sake of having a solution? Yeah. Because it's not actually achieving what those political parties or those perspectives are wanting to achieve. It's just making it look like it. Right. And then coming from the perspective of before we had the right to vote, Mm -hmm. somebody finally realized that it is not okay mentally for women to feel like they are cattle Mm -hmm. or to be needing to be authorized by somebody else for for their existence. Mm -hmm. So somebody finally was like, no, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. We should be able to vote and should be able to have our own property and should be able to have jobs and also be able to 
be paid equally. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's demoralizing yeah. to feel like you are not able to have the same support of the country and of the government that you are supporting. Mm-hmm. And Black Lives Matter movement, that's another scenario of a faction of our country feeling demoralized or feeling devalued because of the hurdles they're experiencing that not everybody else has to experience because of a fractured political and fractured historical Mm -hmm. environment that we live in. And so are we not seeing that this is similar? Yeah. That when a woman gets up and gets her family ready and runs the show at home and spinning 20 plates and still manages to like keep a smile on her face and vote and support her religious organization and volunteer and is doing all these amazing things. And then in the scenario of her healthcare, even if she may never need to use this option, Mm -hmm. there are people actively trying to create hurdles for her to get the care she may need one day. And she's just glad she doesn't need it. Right. That's demoralizing. Yeah. You know, and dehumanizing. You know I would even go one step further. It's yeah. dehumanizing. Perfect. Yeah. 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 It, it, how are you supposed to feel like everything's kind of normal right. in an environment where one day you felt pretty like, yeah, we live in a free country and we, you know, we're like the epitome of democracy in the world to as long as you can navigate through all these little obstacle courses and still be heard, then your voice matters. So I occasionally see these little posts on social media talking about how every family planning clinic that provides any kind of termination procedure is doing the procedure called the DNE. And then they go on to describe it, which I'm I'm not sure if I even want to get into what that is, but it's, it's it can become a very gruesome procedure. But we are subjecting more women to this procedure if we remove this option, correct? Like if we are really talking about what is making it easier on the mother and the fetus. The people that are talking about these procedures and trying to make every termination into a painting the picture of it being this grotesque procedure, we are making that more true by taking this medication off the market. It is much more humane to be able to have access to this drug. That is accurate and with some areas of not complete accurate. Okay. So difference between a Dilation and evacuation versus the dilation and curatage is the dilation and evacuation is done out of necessity because it is a pregnancy that's further along and it will not be something that we can just remove with the simple device of vacuum. It's more likely to get stuck and more likely to cause trauma to the uterus. And so fortunately in that scenario, in order to be able to make sure everything comes out and doesn't get left behind putting the woman at risk for infection and whatnot, the pregnancy has to be essentially destructured, broken down. And yes, it is extremely grotesque. And it's not something as a provider that I ever handle well when in the scenario of having to provide that service for whatever reasons. I haven't needed to too often because usually, again, we're able to, when there is something going on with which compromises the, the woman, or if she's already had a miscarriage, but the pregnancy is still inside, it's usually early on and we're able to just offer her Cytotec or do a, a DNC. But there are a few instances where the pregnancy stops growing and it's in its early second trimester and you have a 16-week baby, but the heart stopped or something between 12 and 16 weeks, but is too small to go through the entire process of laboring like a normal pregnancy and too large to be addressed using the DNC approach. And so in that scenario, a DNE needs to be performed. So the moral of the story is to avoid a DNE if we intercept the process earlier, then it doesn't have to be a DNE. The earlier the pregnancy is, the more likely we're able to just accomplish removing the pregnancy with a suction DNC. It's much quicker, much safer, and definitely less gruesome. With that being said, it comes back down to how do we ensure that if a termination or an abortion is being handled, that it's done as early as possible. Well, we can definitely offer anybody who needs to have a pregnancy removed a DNC early on. 
But again, that's offering a surgery where there is an actual medication that could accomplish the same thing. And so reverse engineering this dilemma, like, so in order to not offer this medication, we will then be increasing the number of women that need a DNC, which if you are debating about whether you want to continue this pregnancy or not, I can completely see a scenario where a young mom, not sure if she is wanting to continue the pregnancy, and then she comes to a family planning clinic and they don't have mifeprostone anymore to offer. So they do what they know is going to be most likely successful and not likely for the woman to need to come back many times, like giving her side attack. So they offer her a DNC, which is straight off the bat, a surgical procedure, which now can be very intimidating. And so she, because she does not want to have this procedure, ends up delaying coming in to get the care she needs, but still isn't wanting to continue the pregnancy. And so she goes away. A couple more weeks have passed now in her of avoidance of getting a procedure. And then she comes back with the same decision, now needing a DNE. and And it's, again, it's, we're not actually stopping the process of elective terminations by removing this drug. We didn't stop people from using drugs by making drugs illegal. We definitely didn't stop kids from drinking alcohol by making the age requirement 21 or smoking by making the age requirement 18. What was effective was anti-tobacco campaigns, education. But for those family planning clinics that are going to continue to be in existence, because this legislation doesn't prevent them from functioning, it just takes away one of their most effective tools. So again, we didn't solve what they consider to be the problem. Now the problem will just go on for a little bit longer and turn into a bigger problem, which will then necessitate more invasive solutions. Well, thank you so much. That really, I feel like I had a general idea. But then, you know, when people ask me more detailed questions, because, you know, in hospital obstetrics, we don't always deal with these. Rarely. Obviously, we can't get the mifeprostone, but we have had very select times where, you know, a mother's life is at risk and we've done the misoprostol and we're just fighting the clock. So that really helps clear a lot of things up. And I hope that that will help clear a lot of things up for other people. Honestly, if I was to summarize what I consider the banning of mifeprostone to be like and draw an analogy similar to the world that I live in right now, it would be like, you know, hospitals are very motivated to have low C-section rates. Right. So it would be like, low. what's better to have a low C-section rate than to just ban C-sections? Yeah. The need for them will not go away. Right. Banning them will probably, in the immediate circumstance, create a solution for the mm -hmm. hospitals. Mm -hmm. And again, let me just reiterate this in case anybody's suddenly confused because they're logging onto this episode randomly in the middle. But this is not <laughs> a real issue. This is a hypothetical analogy. Yeah. But if we have a problem, or in this instance, the hypothetical problem being there's too many C-sections happening. Mm -hmm. Ideally, everybody should have a vaginal birth. Natural is better. Yeah. Let's just make it so that you can't have access to a C-section. Actually, when I got one better. Let's take away access to the anesthetics that we use that will facilitate C-sections. Okay. Oh, there's a more there comparable one. There you go. Right. Yeah. Right? You can have a C-section, so, but no anesthesia. You can have a C-section. We know you'll probably still need one. Mm -hmm. But now that you will have to undergo a more gruesome process of having a C-section, mm -hmm. which you'll have still possibly need, no mm -hmm. guarantees, let's just hope you don't need one. Right. Maybe you will think long and hard yeah. about opting for a C-section right. and really exhaust the possibility of having a vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. But we are here to advocate for you. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So bottom line, Mifeprostone is the medication currently in the news about being banned. And Mesoprostol is the medication that is considered to be benign and effective in the use for inducing labor, as well as effective in completion of miscarriages and or abortions. And I think that both have their place. Right. Both are necessary mm -hmm. for women's health. Both are safe, effective tools. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. I am definitely going to have you back on again to talk about some happier things. Yes. Like Gaia Wellness's expansion nationwide. Absolutely. Access to healthcare, which will help 
Yes. And not to be a business plug, but if there is any listener that is, you know, interested in obtaining more information about the various drugs involved that we were talking about or mm -hmm. is seeking guidance about their pregnancy with regards to the health of the pregnancy or if they're suffering a miscarriage or if they're in any scenario that we discussed, they can always get that education and counseling on GaiaMontless.org. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. It's always a pleasure Absolutely. talking to you. Likewise. Thank you, Kelly. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Do you have questions that you wish a labor nurse could answer? As your due date approaches, do you wish you could pick someone's brain about all the things that might happen during your labor? When you meet with your OB or midwife, do you forget your questions in the moment? Do you feel like you need someone to take more time to walk you through what might happen in the hospital and how to truly mentally prepare? You're in luck because I'm offering this as a free service in 2023. To get details on how to schedule a free session with me, email me at birthjourneysrn at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Don't forget to share the podcast with a friend who can benefit from the valuable insights that we share here. And if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review, it would mean the world to me. If you're ready to work one-on-one -on -one with me to embark on a transformational journey towards a confident and empowered hospital birth experience, go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered and enroll in my Empowered Hospital Birth Coaching Program. Together, we'll create a roadmap to a birth experience that you'll cherish forever. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. Let's make your birth experience extraordinary.